Um, I will have a chance uh, later in the afternoon to um, take part in a panel in which uh, we will focus particularly um, on Guatemala and uh, the, uh, the U.S. role uh, in the, uh, the terrible things that took place um, in, in Guatemala. Uh, at this point, I've been asked to, uh, to speak about uh, the, uh, the crime of genocide itself, and so I want to um, uh, focus uh, on uh, the rest of the world in order to, uh, to put this um, into uh, to context. Uh, I think uh, you know that the, uh, the word uh, genocide uh, was invented um, during World War II. Uh, it was uh, invented by a Polish uh, Jewish uh, scholar of international law who had immigrated uh, to the United States, um, Raphael uh, Lemkin. And in addition to, um, to inventing the word, uh, Lemkin uh, lobbied the, uh, the United Nations to uh, adopt uh, the, uh, the Genocide uh, Convention, which uh, he drafted. Uh, and uh, the United Nations General Assembly um, adopted it by voice vote uh, on December 9, uh, 1948, uh, at a meeting of the General Assembly in, in Paris. It was the first um, international human rights treaty uh, adopted by the United Nations. It was adopted uh, the day before uh, the United Nations uh, adopted the, um, the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, thereafter, Lemkin uh, lobbied uh, for the, uh, the ratification uh, of the, um, uh, the Genocide uh, Convention. I had a personal opportunity uh, to um, gauge his uh, dedication uh, to the lobbying because I was a high school student uh, in New York. Uh, I attended Stuyvesant High School and I was uh, president of the, uh, the History Club. And on behalf of the History Club, uh, I invited Raphael Lemkin to come to our school uh, to speak about the, uh, the Genocide Convention. And uh, he invited me to visit him at the United Nations to meet him in the, uh, the delegates' lounge. I didn't realize it then, but uh, uh, I realized afterwards that he chose the uh, location because he didn't actually have an office uh, at the United Nations, so he could only meet uh, in the, uh, the delegates' lounge. But he was perfectly willing to go to a high school or any place else uh, where he thought he might uh, promote ratification. He was cons uh, particularly interested in uh, ratification uh, by the United States, um, and uh, that didn't happen till nearly 30 years uh, after he died uh, in 1959. Uh, the Genocide Convention was ultimately ratified um, by the United States in 1988 uh, during the last year of the presidency of uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, but it was ratified with uh, so many reservations uh, that, in fact, uh, it uh, effectively nullified uh, the significance of uh, United States uh, ratification of the, um, uh, the Genocide Convention. Um, one of the things that has happened uh, with respect to, uh, to genocide um, since the time uh, of Lemkin and um, before the time of Lemkin is every time uh, there has been uh, a genocide, uh, there have also been those who have been um, eager to, um, uh, to deny um, what took place um, or uh, to try to um, uh, shift the responsibility um, for, uh, for what took place. Uh, of course, Lemkin was reacting to the, um, the crimes of World War II, uh, and that certainly happened um, uh, during uh, World War II. Um, there was, uh, during World War II, a certain amount of information um, in the State Department about um, what was taking place uh, in Nazi-occupied uh, Europe uh, but there were State Department officials at the time who were 
uh, not eager to call attention to the, uh, the Holocaust as it was uh, taking place, um, it appears that their main concern uh, was they did not want to, um, uh, to uh, allow the, uh, the immigration uh, of a larger number of Jewish refugees uh, to the, uh, uh, the United States. Uh, there was an official, a man named Herbert Pell, um, who was the um, father of um, uh, the one-time senator from Rhode Island, Claiborne Pell, um, uh, who lobbied very hard uh, to, um, uh, to allow the, uh, the immigration of uh, Jewish refugees and to call attention uh, to what was taking place uh, in Europe. But Herbert Pell was a, a fairly lonely voice uh, at that time. But it wasn't only in the, uh, the State Department. It was also uh, in various um, other institutions uh, that there were interests in not calling attention uh, to what was taking place. Uh, one example is the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times, uh, then and now, is a Jewish-owned uh, newspaper. Uh, but when um, New York Times reporters uh, gathered information uh, that uh, tended to show what was taking place in Nazi-occupied Europe, uh, the newspaper had uh, a tendency to downplay the story and bury the story uh, deep in the, uh, the paper. And uh, the concern of the, um, the publishers uh, of the New York Times uh, seems to have been uh, that they didn't want uh, Americans uh, to think that they were engaged in a war uh, in Europe um, on behalf of the Jews, uh, and therefore downplaying um, the, uh, the Holocaust uh, was uh, important to them. Uh, one of the, uh, the institutions uh, I respect most in the world uh, is the, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, which um, uh, monitors uh, armed conflicts to try to um, see that the laws of armed conflict um, are um, uh, complied with uh, and tries to ease the, uh, the suffering uh, of people in armed conflict. Uh, but because the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is a Swiss organization separate from the National Red Cross Societies, um, was um, present uh, in uh, different parts uh, of Europe, um, it uh, gathered quite a lot of information um, on uh, what was going on uh, during World War II. And its executive council uh, met in Geneva during the war uh, to discuss whether it should disclose um, what was taking place. And they decided against it. Uh, they decided against it uh, on the ground that uh, it would limit the access of the International Committee of the Red Cross to a certain number of detention centers uh, and therefore compromise their ability to do um, their regular work. And they felt that sustaining um, their regular work was more important than calling attention to the Holocaust. At any rate, in, in the period after World War II, uh, things have been um, uh, like that. Um, when the um, uh, the Cambodian um, Holocaust uh, took place in the, uh, the latter part of the, uh, the 1970s. Um, it was uh, among those who were uh, eager to, uh, to deny the crimes that were being committed um, by the, uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, were a number of leftists um, in the United States, um, peace activists who had uh, opposed the, uh, the war in Vietnam. So uh, prominent among them were uh, a man named Gareth Porter and a man named George Hildebrand. Uh, and they published at that time um, arguing that uh, the reason the Khmer Rouge was driving people out of uh, Phnom Penh and the other cities um, of uh, Cambodia uh, was for the good of the, uh, the residents uh, of those cities. And Noam Chomsky and his uh, regular 
uh, co-author Edward Herman wrote an article for The Nation at the time uh, echoing the arguments uh, of um, uh, Porter and, and Hildebrandt. Uh, when uh, the, um, uh, the genocide against the, uh, the Kurds uh, took place in Iraq, uh, in 1988, uh, what was called the, um, the Anfal, uh, one of the, um, uh, the dramatic moments of that uh, was Saddam Hussein's uh, use of chemical weapons uh, in the, uh, the Kurdish town of Halabja. And apparently about 5,000 people were killed in Halabja uh, by the, uh, the use of, of chemical weapons. Uh, the State Department uh, at that time um, didn't want to uh, confirm uh, that uh, this had uh, taken place and cast doubt uh, on it. And uh, the CIA was uh, also um, active on this. The, the reason was uh, that 1988 was the, um, the last year of the, uh, the Iraq-Iran War and America's en enemy was the Khomeini regime uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, State Department officials were not eager to discredit Saddam Hussein uh, for the use of um, chemical weapons. To his great credit, um, after uh, a period, Secretary of uh, State George Shultz uh, broke ranks. Uh, he was influenced by a State Department official uh, Morton Abramowitz, who had uh, investigated the matter, and Schultz acknowledged publicly uh, that the Saddam Hussein uh, had used the um, uh, the chemical weapons uh, in um, Halaj, Halabja. Uh, at the time of the uh, the Bosnian War, um, I encountered um, uh, this sort of thing from uh, UN. Uh, officials. I can remember uh, one meeting I had uh, in Sarajevo uh, during the war with the, uh, the UN commander uh, at that time, a British general, uh, General Sir Michael Rose, who had um, just arrived on the scene. And uh, General Sir Michael Rose um, echoed the line uh, which um, I had heard previously from a number of other UN officials and that is that the, um, the atrocities that took place uh, against the Bosnian Muslims had been committed by the Bosnian Muslims themselves in order to arouse international sympathy and get international uh, intervention uh, in the war in, uh, in Bosnia. And uh, General Rose uh, told me that the famous um, breadline massacre uh, in Sarajevo had been committed by uh, the Muslims themselves, that they had blown up a mine at the scene. And he was brand new in, in Sarajevo, so I asked him uh, if he had been to the scene, and he said he had not. And I asked him whether, as a military man, he knew what a mortar explosion looked like on a sidewalk. And he did, and he could describe it. It creates a flower uh, kind of pattern, a mine exploding tears up the, uh, the earth. It's a very different thing. Uh, I had visited the scene. Uh, many others uh, had visited the scene. Uh, but the UN officials were um, telling their story about a mine explosion to, um, uh, to create the view that the Muslims were inflicting casualties um, on, on themselves. The, uh, the UN didn't want um, conflict to take place at that moment. Uh, Britain and France were supplying um, the principal troops in Bosnia. They were engaged in humanitarian assistance. They didn't want uh, military intervention, which they thought would interfere with the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And so they came up with these uh, stories about um, people uh, committing atrocities uh, against themselves. Uh, when the Rwandan uh, genocide uh, took place, uh, in 1994, uh, the United States um, was uh, among those most eager uh, to avoid um, any possibility of uh, involvement. Uh, the Clinton administration had uh, sort of escaped the bullet uh, with respect to the, uh, the killing of 18 Marines 
uh, in Mogadishu in Somalia six months um, earlier uh, than the, uh, the Rwandan genocide and didn't want um, an involvement in another African uh, conflict that it did not understand. And so the U.S. was in the forefront of those in the U.N. Security Council calling for uh, the withdrawal um, of uh, U.N. troops uh, from Rwanda. And as I uh, think you, you probably know, General Dallaire, the Canadian uh, commander of the U.N. troops in, uh, in Rwanda, felt that uh, he could have um, done something quite significant to... Um, uh, to halt the, um, the genocide in Rwanda. Any rate, um, this is uh, the, uh, the pattern. We'll get to the, uh, the role of the United States uh, with respect to, um, uh, to what took place um, in um, uh, Guatemala. Uh, in my view, um, there are um, many discreditable episodes that have taken place uh, in dealing with uh, genocide uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, but I think the, um, uh, the way the United States uh, behaved in, um, uh, in Guatemala may take the cake. Uh, and that's a, a later chapter in the, the story uh, this afternoon. The only thing I would say uh, in, in conclusion, uh, or maybe two things in conclusion, one, one uh, thing is that um, all these efforts to, um, to act as an apologist uh, for um, uh, genocide or to, um, uh, to pretend uh, that um, it was uh, not um, uh, taking place uh, are important because um, in every case, um, if there had been acknowledgement of what was taking place, while it was taking place, um, it would have had an effect uh, upon the, uh, the situation. Uh, the genocide might not have been um, halted, uh, but it would have been mitigated um, by acknowledgement um, of um, what was taking place um, at the, uh, the moment uh, that it was uh, taking place. Acknowledgement after the fact um, which is what we got in the, um, uh, the trial that took place in Guatemala, is immensely important uh, because I think that too has uh, a tremendous impact on the possibility uh, that uh, genocide will take place uh, at other times. But even more important um, than recognizing genocide um, after the fact, it seems to me, is uh, recognizing it while it uh, takes place. The other thing I would say in conclusion uh, is I'd, I'd really quote a, um, a colleague of mine, um, uh, an anthropologist named uh, Beatrice Manns, uh, who worked with me um, in the, uh, the 1980s in trying to investigate what was going on in Guatemala at the time uh, that it took place and who testified um, as a prosecution witness um, in the, uh, the trial in Guatemala. Uh, I know Beatrice made a talk, gave a talk um, on this uh, case uh, a few days ago in, uh, in California, and uh, I'm borrowing from uh, what she had to say uh, at that time. Um, uh, she said that uh, in 1633, uh, the Holy Office uh, required uh, Galileo um, uh, to recant uh, his claim that the, uh, the earth um, moved around the sun um, and um, the, uh, the Holy Office annulled his uh, teaching. And after the trial, uh, Galileo said, and yet it moves. Uh, in this case, uh, the Constitutional Court annulled the, uh, the verdict against Rios Mont, and I would say, or she, she said, and yet the verdict will stand. Thank you.